Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to Science in the Time of Corona. Our last panel discussion on ways that COVID-19 has impacted how scientists conduct research. My name is Ayla, I use Twitter pronouns, and I'm a rising senior at Reed College. Over the last several months, we've all experienced the restructuring of our social lives that has resulted from new social distancing precautions. And personally, as a college student, I really miss the daily conversations that I had with friends in hallways, cafes, and classrooms. And I feel the impact that this has had on how I interact with the world around me. And so in this time, as an anthropology major who's interested in scientists and how they conduct their research, I wonder whether social distancing has also jostled the structure of scientific research. Um, and if so, are these changes for the better and how likely are they to stay? So these are just some of the initial questions that I hope will guide our discussion today. And for those of you who are joining us live, please feel free to um, contribute your own questions throughout the discussion via YouTube and Facebook in the comments section. Um, we'd love to get you all involved in this discussion. And don't forget to subscribe to QBI TV while you're here. Um, so today we get to talk with two researchers in the QBI Coronavirus Research Group, or QCRG. Um, so would you two like to introduce yourselves and maybe say just a little bit about your expertise? Yeah, I guess I'll go first. So my name is Mehdi Buhadu. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Krogan Lab at UCSF, working with QCRG and QBI. Um, my research focuses primarily in cancer research, where I study how protein-protein interactions um, between so different proteins that are mutated during cancer, how they, how those, how the, the interactions between those proteins affect drug sensitivity or um, disease prognosis and progression. Um, and but now I'm working a lot on SARS-CoV-2, um, COVID-19, because our entire lab is working on it. Um, so, um, and it's been really exciting so far. Uh, yeah, and my name is Robin Cake, uh, she, her, hers. I'm an assistant adjunct professor in the Krogan lab. Um, I mostly study how pathogens interact with their host uh, using a variety of mass, spec uh, mass spectrometry based proteomics techniques. Mm, my main specialty is in something called cross-linking mass spec. Uh, basically I use chemicals to freeze things inside of the cell and then see how those things got frozen. Sweet, thank you. Um, so what I'm curious about is what it's been like um, for both of you to do research during this time. Um, what has changed, what hasn't changed um, about the ways that you conduct research and work with your fellow scientists. Um, and so maybe one way to start that off is just, um, do you miss being in the lab and why or why not? Are there things that happen in the lab that now don't happen over Zoom and Slack and these different technologies that we now have to use to keep in touch? Um, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll start. Or <laughs> um, so I think one of the biggest things about I miss about being in the lab is connecting with people um, more organically. So just kind of running into someone in the hallway or meeting up with them um, just in person, just to talk, uh, bounce ideas off of, or ask for help. Um, I think Slack and Zoom help with that, but it's um, not quite the same as getting to be in person um, and just kind of having a idea come to you while you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think when you're in lab, you're it's much more, I mean, there's an informality about how you can just directly talk to somebody next to you. Um, but I think what, what working from home has done is we're all on Slack, we're all on our computers all day. So now I can almost turn to someone in New York City on Slack and immediately ask, immediately ask them a question like as if I was right next to them. Um, so it doesn't feel, there's, there is sort of a personality, like a person to person contact that's lost. But I would say that there's much more free flow of information between uh, people across 
many different states and, and even countries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and how has that, so that's kind of like, I guess, an interpersonal level of communication. What about even um, communicating findings? How does that change when, um, when you're not in the lab or um, I've noticed definitely like people are using things like preprints a lot more. Um, I don't know, why do you think that is or what does that change about how scientists communicate with one another? Um, I can start on that. Yeah, I think I think that we it's it's much more free flowing now. I mean, I think one thing that I've noticed is a breakdown of of the hierarchy, and we've been discussing this in our group is is that um, you know I'm finding myself in Zoom meetings with Nobel Prize laureates at Rockefeller, you know, mm-hmm. and that's really exciting. You know, I, I usually don't talk to these people, um, so I think there's sort of a breakdown of, of the the formality and, and the hierarchy. Um, because we're all just at home in our living rooms, everyone's sort of going through the same thing. Um, so, so there's sort of a, it sort of um, breaks down, breaks down that that hierarchy and those barriers a bit more. Yeah, I think along those lines too, there's a breakdown in kind of the traditional barriers that are put up between academia and industry. Um, that there's now a more easy communication between academic and industry partners where. Um, yeah, we can share information and uh, data and ideas over Slack now and over Zoom. And there's, um, yeah, I, I think many said it really well. There's less formality um, that we're trying to adhere to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, um, another another thing that you're bringing up is um, sort of this idea of hierarchy and um, I wonder, especially in a group as big as QCRG, um, it seems, uh, I don't know, it was interesting to see um, the sort of shift in how authorship is dealt with. And I wonder if um, you could speak to that and also in like how that could or could not kind of stick around in the future. how would that change the way that people do research, you think? I guess I could start with that. Um, yeah, I think authorship has has really changed. Um, you know, in science, we're really, we're almost obsessed with authorship, right? Who's gonna be first, who's gonna be last? Those are very prestigious positions on papers that we write and that can really affect what grants you're able to get. Um, but what, what I've seen during this pandemic is um, also, I don't think it's completely gone, but it's, I think, much less apparent now. And I think that uh, everyone is sort of, you know, as scientists, we also work on things that usually take five years, 10 years to really see an impact. But I think during COVID-19, scientists suddenly, you know, we, we all thought, what can we do right now um, in our living rooms to to address these, these um, issues? Um, so so um, I think it's sort of, broken down authorship because now I don't care who's first author. Like we're all just in it together and we're all just trying our best to to contribute in the most meaningful way possible. Yeah, I think Medi pretty much nailed it. Uh, there's a much stronger sense of, I think, community because we're all in it together and we're all communicating more freely. Um, I think the other thing that's uh, kind of interesting about how authorship kind of gets handled now is that there's, um, because we're all contributing in our own way from our living, our living rooms, like Medi said, there's like a shared sense of ownership and a shared sense of like contribution. So I, I think everybody is just trying to, yeah, meet the moment and trying to do their, you know, their best to help solve this crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm also curious about, Robin, what you were bringing up about um, uh, breaking down the barriers between academia and industry. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and what um, what that's led to. Sure, and I'll probably uh, hop this over to Medi too. Um, 
So Mehdi and I were very fortunate to work with um, an industry partner called Zoic Labs. Um, they're part of a larger studio, I guess. Uh, we actually, this was kind of a serendipitous interaction and I think Mehdi would do a better job explaining it because he was there from the very beginning. But I think for me, what opened my eyes uh, during the pandemic was how much we could interact with industry and how collaborative it could truly be. Um, and hearing ideas from their perspective could feed into how we distribute our data and how we look at our work and getting kind of that non, non biologist, non you know, network specialist information from them and kind of understanding where they're coming from. So I think it's really helped to, at least for me, open my eyes as to like the possibilities and the potential that like, uh, for what we can actually accomplish. Yeah, the only thing I, that's, I agree completely, the only thing I would add is that, um, yeah, th these people, they, they make movies for Hollywood, right? And um, they're very talented graphic artists. And, um, and I, think, I think a scientist studying COVID-19, everyone in the world is affected by this. We're, we're pretty popular right now, you know? People wanna work mm -hmm. with us, which is exciting. Um, and so, so these, these um, sort of non-traditional collaborations are really starting to sprout out from this. And that's, I think, super exciting. And I think it's, um, as Robin was alluding to, there are things that as scientists we, we need help with. And one of them is visualization. I think we could do better. And I think these experts that make movies are, are just the perfect people to, to help out with that. Yeah, that's really cool. And um, I think that that kind of leads well into another question that I had about sort of the um, public attention that scientists are getting right now. Um, oh, um, yeah, so I think that, um, yeah, so one other thing that I was wanting to bring up about um, this public attention is, um, do you think that this makes you sort of, um, think about your role as a scientist differently from how you normally would? Do you feel that um, you are being kind of, um, like having to think about the way that you communicate your science differently? And do you think that's like a good thing or a bad thing? And then we can get to the second question, which I think is a good question. Yeah. I mean, I do think that, uh, sorry, Maddie, I'll take this one. Um, I think that there, as scientists, we always try to communicate our work. Um, we don't maybe always do it in the most um, obvious ways, and sometimes it's confusing. Uh, I think the you know pandemic has really made apparent how much we do need to communicate our work and how much we need to not just put the data out, but explain it and to make sure that uh, the majority of people can understand what we do and understand um, you know, how we got to our findings and why we got to our findings, why we're doing what we're doing. So I think scientific communication has become really um, at the forefront of, at least for me, what I think is important about being a scientist, um, in addition to doing the actual work, it just has become so much more um, urgent, I think, in these, in these times. I don't have anything to add to that. I think that was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what, so to take this audience question, I guess, um, these new ways of doing science, breaking down hierarchies and authorship, um, breaking down barriers between industry and academia, um, the intense collaboration that we've seen and the speed and urgency with which people are doing science. Uh, do you have ideas about how this could be sustained? Um, so, so what we've seen in our group is that collaboration is, is, is really powerful. It's a really powerful tool in science and we're sort of able to accomplish uh, and accomplish things much faster by collaborating with other scientists. Um, we've put out papers in a matter of, of months that usually take us years. Um, so, and we actually are already a collaborative lab to begin with, but this has sort of amplified that. So I would say that 
we need to find ways of doing this collaborative science moving forward. And I think I think it's about people realizing what is what is the main drive behind, you know, I think having that that right mentality that the goal is to find new things, to find new treatments for diseases and to do it together. I mean, I think that needs to be the drive behind what people are doing because I think that's what's really been showcased during COVID-19. Yeah, I think I pretty much got it. I, the only thing I would add is that I think uh, this type of science and especially the kind of network of scientists that we've connected to and kind of the new collaborations that we've built, um, including industry partners, I think as long as there's a will to keep doing it that way, that it can be sustained. And it's a matter of um, how creative we are moving forward. And I think now that we've seen the possibilities, uh, we're not limited so much by what we think is possible and are more eager to pursue what we want to be possible as opposed to like limiting ourselves, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think we have another audience member question. Yeah. Um, so this question is, um, if or when we have a vaccine or effective drugs to treat COVID-19 patients, um, what will you do with your cancer projects? <laughs> um, that's a good question. <laughs> so I think, I think, the, the, the right answer to this question is that in, in, doing, in doing this research that we've done in COVID-19, we've all learned a bunch of new skills. And I think all of us scientists have, have a very defined skill set. And that's why collaboration is so great because you can exploit somebody else, use somebody else's skill set to enhance the research overall. And so in doing this, these collaborative projects, I've learned a ton about, about how to do science better um, so I'm going to apply those to my cancer projects. I mean, the, 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 the approaches I've learned are very, very applicable generally. Um, and I think collaborative science inspires that sort of broader learning and, and um, education, you know, of scientists um, in general. So that's another plus of collaboration, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It seems like this is a time when um, this sort of, I've heard it described as like a disease agnostic approach where you have your kind of approach to learning about a virus or really, or even beyond viruses. Um, and uh, you can kind of apply it to anything and that kind of lends itself to collaboration in a way. Yeah, I, I think, um, so in the Krogan lab, we're uh, a systems biology lab. Um, which is a nice way of saying yes, that we apply a bunch of different techniques in order to try to study uh, the whole system as opposed to just one piece of, uh, of the system. So we try to study things kind of on a broader level. Um, and, and yes, you're correct. We, we do tend to use the uh, phrase disease agnostic because we like to apply ourselves and our technologies to, you know, whatever problems we think are the most interesting, the most urgent. You know, I think the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown us quite how uh, flexible and um, agile we actually are in that we could really pivot uh, quite quickly. I, I think more than any of us were aware we could do. Um, and so I think it's been pretty remarkable to see um, exactly like how how quickly things can be you know accomplished yeah I, I wouldn't add much to that i i agree i mean i think the methods that a lot of labs employ can be generally applicable to, to many different disease areas um and so i think that's you know really breaking down these silos as our our boss nevin krogan always says i mean by breaking down silos between virologists and cancer biologists and and psycho, um, psychiatrists were able to, um, to to really sort of find new things because people have certain ways of thinking in one field but they might not have thought to think like a virologist in neuroscience but when you do that you could discover something pretty cool 
Yeah. Oh, we have, so we have another question from the audience. Um, so in this opportunity to connect to the public um, and with your mention of your recent publications, um, what kind of take home message would you want to, would you want people to know about what you have found so far? Do you want to try Robin? Yeah, I can try. So I think um, for our, you know, our recent nature publication, we were trying to study uh, how SARS-CoV-2 uh, molecules, so the parts of the virus, how they interact with things inside of our cells. Um, and so we used a technique called if needed purification mass spec. Essentially what we do is we use the virus protein like a little magnet and see what's get, what gets stuck to it. Um, and essentially we build, we did build this SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interaction map. Um, and we identified from it several of the proteins which were druggable, meaning other scientists um, have found drugs that can inhibit those proteins. Um, and I kind of the big, really exciting take home message was that we found two classes of drugs that can actually stop virus um, replication inside of cell models. So I think, I, I hope the main take home message in addition to finding those kind of two classes of drugs would be that you can use this type of systems biology and network biology method to find druggable targets, to find things um, that you could use to then hopefully uh, help clinical scientists um, discover new drugs that could potentially be a treatment for um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Nice. I think that's very <laughs> impressively concise considering all the work you two have been doing. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has created a template and infrastructure in science for a future response to pandemics? I think, uh, so go ahead. I'll move over first. I, I think, um, I don't know if I would say that there has been a template or infrastructure that's been made. I think what will happen is maybe there will be kind of like a, a couple years from now, maybe people will look back. I, I hope this is what happens anyways, that people will look back and say, these are the things that worked and these are the things that maybe didn't work and that we can learn from them and that we can learn from, okay, how was science done during this time? How was data distributed during this time? How did we respond? What did we do good? What did we do bad? Um, so I don't necessarily think that people will come back and say like, this is exactly the way that we should pursue pandemics in the future. Um, I, uh, I think that it will hopefully be a learning experience that people can, can learn from. Yeah, and I, I would just add that you can you can sort of remove the last part of this question and just say, has this pandemic, well, how will it influence the future of science? And I think it, it has the potential to because because of what we've seen we can accomplish by by collaborating and by breaking down hierarchies and and by focusing less on authorship considerations. I think these kinds of changes can have really big sustaining impact and bring about more discovery to 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 the public. Yeah, um, going off of that, um, speaking of kind of this time of uh, change in science, um, I wonder if um, thinking about other things that have, that have been happening recently and um, especially the ongoing protests in response to um, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, I wonder if um, events like these, especially in a time when science has kind of been brought closer to the public in a lot of ways because of the immediacy of this virus, um, I wonder if those things have changed maybe the way scientists see themselves um, and their role in the social sphere. And do you think that this virus is kind of and the response to it has opened up a space for a big structural change in science? Um, I guess I can start. Yeah, I think I think that 
what these events have shown is that we we do have some thinking to do in science. Um, I think that when you look at the, the faculty, you know, we could have more minorities, uh, more more women, more people of color, more Black people specifically. Um, and I think that through the pandemic, I think we've come to a lot of reckoning about things in science that are probably not working as well as they could be. Um, and I think this is one of them. Um, and I think this sort of just add, adds to things that we need to do better. Yeah, I think that um, it's definitely a good time to reflect and take a look at uh, kind of the Institute of Science and um, examine some of the, how systemic racism has really um, given advantages to some and maybe withheld those advantages to others. I, am, I think in all of this, it, including the pandemic, it's very clear that I mean, people of color, minorities, black people are not treated the same and do not have the same benefits that a lot of us have. And I think part of kind of this moment is to take a look at how, you know, on an individual level, how I got to where I am and the advantages and benefits that I received, you know, for being who I am and for looking the way I look and trying to understand that, you know, this is a time that perhaps science can change. And if we're brave and bold enough and willing to examine ourselves, I think it's a time that we can change. So I, I do think that this is a good moment for us to really examine um, you know, how we can make those changes actualities and, and not just talk about them. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, we have a, a few more questions from the audience. Um, how have your families responded to your work on this scientific challenge, and especially now that it's kind of the top of everyone's news? Um, I mean, my family, I, I definitely have never worked harder in my life. <clears throat> so I haven't really seen them that much. <laughs> um, so, so they've responded, you know, in part, they're very proud of the work that we're doing and, and um, have extended family in Morocco. They're very proud of, of what's happening here, what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're working um, like most of the day, um, especially like last month and, and a few months before that, we were working, um, you know, sometimes 14 hours a day. So, so I think it's uh, left our families a bit a bit lonely, <laughs> um, but I think they understand the importance of, of what we're doing, and I think it'll be fine if if um, we'll get to see them soon, hopefully. Yeah, I would say uh, my family is very supportive of what I do. Um, we do like to joke with each other, so whenever I send them articles about work that I've done or worked on, they go, oh, okay. <laughs> I understood some of that. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, I, I think it's it's really important to have the support of your family. Uh, and um, hopefully they're, you know, proud of what we do and uh, can ask us questions if they want. <laughs> um, how has the writing of manuscripts changed um, with so many authors and collaborations coming together and with so many different expertise? How do you manage all those people when you're writing a paper? Yeah, for us, um, we almost exclusively now write manuscripts and grants using Google Documents. So it's a way to maybe basically collaboratively work on a single document. Um, I think the benefit of this is that you can use suggestion mode so people can see who's made the edits. You can tag people if you think they should be working on something. Um, it timestamps things. So if you know something comes up later in time, you can basically be like, oh, we already talked about that. So I, I can you know resolve this comment. So um, pretty much, almost all of our manuscripts, even when we're only working on collaborations of like two people, we we use Google documents to, to write our, 
all of our manuscripts and grants. Yeah, we just we just put another, together another paper where you know almost every figure um, has a, a different lab that's contributing to it. Um, so then each section of the paper can be written by a different person uh, initially. And so what I've found is that that can create situations where you have um, sort of a different um, sort of language language that's used and a different flow to the paper, um, different syntax. Uh, so so what's I think really important is to go through the document as one person and sort of try to tie everything together. Um, I think that is important because when someone's reading a paper, they don't want to, they don't, it's hard to jump between different um, sort of writing styles. Um, so I think it's important for at least one person to comb through it at the end and make sure that it's consistent in terms of the writing style. But I think, uh, yeah, like Robin says, we do everything on Google Docs. Anybody at any time can, can write something in the Google Doc. Mm -hmm. Um, this next next question builds nicely off of this. What about um, other platforms for uh, communicating your findings? Yeah, so I think right now um, we're still pretty much in the traditional, you know, print publication. It's online now, um, which is useful, but there is something to be said about, I think, peer review um, and making sure that you know, independent scientists can look at what you've done and uh, kind of verify that what you're doing is sound. Um, I would say that um, in terms of trying to communicate what's written in your manuscript, there's, I think, a lot of new types of technologies that are coming up. Um, one plug that I think I will make is that the collaboration we did with Zoic Labs, we've made an interactive network map. So um, it's basically online and anyone can interact with it and get the information from us. Um, and we try to basically put as much of the information from our paper into that interactive network map. So I think things like that, where we can collaborate with, you know, communication teams and like media studios. And um, I do think that there are other additional ways that we can communicate the information in manuscripts that uh, is maybe more intuitive and easier for um, everyone to understand as opposed to reading, uh, you know, straight through um, a, a publication. Um, oh, follow up. Um, how do you or can you um, make this knowledge more accessible to the general public? Yeah, so I mean, what we're what we've done in the past is we we're we're writing different articles. So typically, we write one research article for a scientific journal, and that's fairly technical language. Um, but but I but what we've done is we've written a few articles, you know, um, in collaboration with different uh, popular news outlets, um, like the Conversation, for example, and and in those sort of um, um, arenas, we can break down the science in a in a more um, palatable way for the lay public. Um, so, so that's one way that we, we try to get our information out to, to the general public. But we're definitely open to, to more of these opportunities because I think, I think the science is really interesting and could be interesting to anybody, even if they're not a scientist. Um, and, and it's a challenge for us scientists to be able to break it down in, in, a, in a simple enough way um, for, for people to understand um what, what's going on in the science yeah um yeah i think these are great ideas to make it more accessible because everyone's so interested in learning about it right now especially so it might be a good time to really explore which of these methods are the best at getting your information out there um one i think this might be our last question um do you think that after your paper there will be more appreciation for how basic science can help biomedical research i guess the like short answer is i hope so <laughs> um i do think that I, I i mean i hope that in the you know biomedical field that they do appreciate basic research and that they understand that um, you know, without basic research, you you wouldn't be able to do, uh, you know, 
many, many, many of the things that we do today, uh, mo most of this is built off of basic researchers who, you know, do the kind of groundwork. Um, I do think that there um, will be kind of probably more interest in the type of research that we do as people see the benefits of it for finding drugs. Um, and yeah, I, I hope that there is already a good appreciation for basic research and that it will grow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think through the projects that we're doing, we're showing that we can go from, from very basic research type experiments um, to translational impact very quickly. I mean, some of our drugs are being considered for, for clinical trials now. And so, so yeah, I think by, by delineating these, these basic mechanisms, basically by basic research, we're finding out basically how it works, right? What is the, what is the actual mechanism underlying an effect? And once you know that answer, you can design better drugs. You can, um, you can actually have an impact translationally. So yeah, I think, I think that's what people need to understand. And I think, um, I think people are getting, getting more of that. Um, and I think that's been made apparent by our work, especially. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely been very impressive to see um, how quickly and, uh, um, or yeah, how quickly this research has happened, how many people are involved and excited to help. Um, and uh, I do think that, um, yeah, some of these things that we've talked about hopefully will stick around. Um, maybe this will continue to lead us to think about um, the hierarchies that exist in science and uh, um, the benefits of breaking some of those down. Um, and uh, yeah, if do either of you have thoughts to wrap up or um, I think we're, I think our audience members are uh, done with their questions. No, I mean, I just want to say, I think this is a really interesting uh, topic to, to consider and document right now because, uh, you know, maybe in six months we'll be back at work, uh, all of us, and um, we'll have forgotten about these these things that we experience now. So so I think it's great that, that we're, we're talking about this and, and we need to continue to and maybe even write articles about it and, and really get people thinking about how, what lessons we've learned from this. Yeah, I think I just second that, you know, and uh, thank you for kind of leading this conversation. Um, great job. <laughs> great job. Thank you both for making the time to do this. This has been really fun. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone who joined and um, don't forget to subscribe to QBI TV.